Welcome to the channel, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome Gary Trosclair to the channel today. I'm very excited to have him here. We've had some discussions in the past, but this is our first recorded interview. His latest book is The Healthy Compulsive, which we're going to discuss in depth today. Gary is a Jungian analyst and psychotherapist in both New York City and in Westchester County, New York. Um, he also has a blog, The Healthy Compulsive Project. We're going to link everything uh, below in the description so you can go check out uh, all of the, the things Gary is working on after the interview. Um, so welcome to the channel, Gary. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here and uh, I've always appreciated all the work that you do for the OCPD community. It's great. Uh, it's helping, uh, I think, a big shift. I, I really appreciate you saying that. And uh, I've been uh, following your work, following your blog, uh, reading reading all the stuff that you put out for a long time. So this is uh, this is a really uh, exciting video for me to put together. We've actually been trying to put this together for a very long time. Yeah. I would say most of the, uh, the procrastination has been on my end, but here we are today. So jumping into things, um, I do wanna say that your book, The Healthy Compulsive, I've, I've read it probably three or four times now uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, I bring that up because uh, in preparing for the interview, I really wanted to um, be able to, to absorb as much of the book as possible. I wanted to meditate on the ideas that you had put forth. Some of them were new to me when I read the book. Um, and I also wanted to try to layer them into how I personally approach uh, OCPD myself. Um, and I wanted to uh, read and reread the text because I've personally approached OCPD in the past, um, I, I guess, in a different way. And so the book was very eye opening. Uh, everybody that watches the channel knows that I don't specifically have any formal background or training. Um, so I'm going to defer to you on a lot of the things that we talk about. Um, but uh, on this channel, I'm merely discussing this topic as somebody that has spent their life living with OCPD that's diagnosed with OCPD. Um, so my opinions are layman's opinions, but because my point of view in the past hasn't perfectly aligned with all of the ideas that you put forth in the book. I, like I said, I'm really excited to dig into these topics to present to my audience, uh, not only some new concepts, but also have these ideas presented with someone with an extensive clinical background. That's really important to me. Um, and I also want to make it clear, uh, if, if that was confusing, that I don't disagree with anything in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, there are some ideas though, that I thought would make for, for interesting uh, to debate on. Um, they are, it's more that how I've approached OCPD up to this point has come from a place of frustration and failure. Um, and what I mean by that is, is my own frustration and failure with trying to get a grip or come to grips with OCPD and to um, make forward progress. Mm -hmm. So um, the concept that OCPD can be channeled into something positive, which is a lot of what you talk about in your book, is an idea that um, I've heard about, but it, more or less it's foreign to me. Mm -hmm. Um, so although it is foreign to me, that doesn't mean that the thought has never crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people with, uh, undiagnosed OCPD often do view many of their obsessions and compulsions in a positive light, meaning that they, they're not aware OCPD exists and maybe they're, um, they're doing really well in their, um, secular life. And, uh, they don't often attribute the distress that they're experiencing as being tied into those same traits that are helping them succeed in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Um, personally, I'm able to see where a driven personality has been, has benefited me. And I definitely wish at times that I could keep those aspects and eliminate the parts that I don't like. Mm -hmm. And, and I have tried to do that, but, but more or less unsuccessfully. So all that said, um, I think that this is kind of a good place to start. Um, so would I be correct in saying that a, a very rudimentary oversimplification oversimplification of the basis of your book is that we can use uh, or we can learn to use our powers of uh, obsessiveness and compulsiveness for good. Yeah, that's definitely a, a good summation of what I'm getting at. I mean, things like planning, being meticulous, uh, doing our best to get things as good as they can be. These are all really good traits, working hard. Uh, if, however, our insecurity gets in the way and hijacks them, then they become very rigid. Uh, these traits are, um, uh, they're just maladaptive versions of something that uh, it can be really productive. I, I like to think of it uh, as these uh, basic 
compulsive personality traits or like water. Uh -huh. OCPD is like ice. It's the same substance, but it's frozen into rigidity. And as I mentioned okay. just now, that happens when we feel insecure about something and we feel like we have to get these things down perfectly, and we exaggerate them, and that's when we get ourselves into trouble. Um, there's reason to believe that these traits were selected for through evolution, so they must have some very uh, positive uh, potential. It does take work sometimes for us to channel them in a productive way, but it makes sense to me that and based on my clinical experience, that it can change and it can go into the right direction. Yeah, that was that was definitely the the big takeaway for for me from your book. Um, one of the first things that jumped out at me when reading your book uh, is the idea of a driven personality being something positive, uh, and you specifically describe it as an innate personality style. So we can deduce that this leaves room for it to develop into a positive trait, a negative trait, or a bit of both is, is what I took away. Right. Um, the way that the DSM-5 is set up right now, they, they look at it categorically. It's it, you have it or you don't have it. And mm -hmm. some movement now to switch to what we call a, a dimensional approach, which is that we're all in a spectrum uh, from it, it being healthy compulsivity to unhealthy compulsivity. Um, and it takes consciousness and, and work to be able to use those traits, but it is possible to channel them in a way that actually works for us. Yeah, definitely. I think that really um, goes into what my next question was gonna be, uh, because I really like that the book was not specifically directed at only people with OCPD. Uh, I, uh, you know, this channel is dedicated to talking about OCPD and mental health um, more broadly, but there are a lot of people that find this channel because of, of different characteristics um, that they're searching for information online about, and they, you know, they end up finding the channel. Um, so because the, the types of traits we're talking about go far beyond just those with uh, OCPD, um, you know, I think it's, it's fantastic that you know, your book also is more broadly talking to those that are experiencing these types of traits. Um, yeah. You know, with let's, OCPD. Let's about, yeah, go let's ahead. Think in terms of perfectionism, for instance, you know, that's not all bad. Think of the guys that designed the 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 motors for the the plane that you flew out to Wisconsin in. You know, thank sure. goodness yeah. that they were perfectionistic. Uh, uh, I, I myself is a am a, a compulsive vacation planner. And my family has really benefited from that. Danger is if I get there and things don't go exactly to my plan, I, I can be miserable, you know? So I've sure. got to learn to let it go. But in taking a more serious example, uh, think of a parent who wants to be a perfect parent. That has its benefits for their child. They'll be well taken care of. They'll be well thought out. But let's say that the child doesn't conform to the parent's expectations and the parent starts to withdraw their love from the child that's going to have serious implications for the child down the line. So potentially good, but potentially pretty bad as well. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you very much about the plane. Um, you know, I, this is something I thought about a lot in regards to other mental health issues as well. Um, we have a lot of um, brilliant artists throughout history that have uh, that have suffered greatly with different um, mental health issues and they were able to channel components of it into their art and some were able to um, have successful and happy lives eventually and others succumb to you know depression and and things of that nature so there's you know both sides of the coin and uh and obviously we want to focus on uh having a positive outcome uh, also, speaking of, um, you know, parenting and children, uh, as these traits, I think, can and usually are formed in our formative years, do you think it's possible to point uh, specifically to external forces that might be causing a rise in those with an unhealthy compulsive personality type? And if so, do you think that there are specific things parents can do to decrease the likelihood that a driven personality, uh, as you describe it, would wind up being detrimental to their child. Yeah. So when you say now uh, some things that are happening, are you referring to just parenting or culture in general? 
Uh, I think a combination. I think that parenting is being, you know, influenced a lot by the culture. Yeah. And I guess I'm, I'm speaking, you know, more or less within the United States. Okay. That's where we're located, and that's where we're seeing things play out. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think the the culture impacting the way people parent, um, and and just seeing a. Lot, it just seems to me that there's a rise in people. Um, paying attention to their mental health and noticing maladaptive traits. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and then do you think that there's things that parents could do to, to yeah. make adjustments? Yeah, let's start with the parents first and then maybe talk about the cultural part after that. Okay. Um, what, uh, well, definitely parenting has an impact on this. Um, Genes account from anywhere from 25 to 75 percent of this. Mm -hmm. Even if we split the difference, say 50 percent of it, genes are a big part of it. But parenting is a big part of it. I don't. I want to start out by saying that I don't think that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between what we might call good parenting and, and a healthy child. I, I've seen a lot of people who had pretty bad parenting, who ended up being really wonderful individuals, and people who had bad parents who turned out to be really good individuals. Did I get that right? I think you see what I'm saying, right? Yes. I'm at a inverted. <laughs> yes. I, I'm sorry. Um, but it still, it does make a difference. And, and here are some of the ways that I think are important. It's important for them to have a sense of being loved unconditionally. If the parent has these high standards, these high goals, which the child does not feel that they're meeting, then that's when the, the potentially good traits get frozen into rigidity and, and stubbornness. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they feel so insecure about being loved and being worthy, being decent, being enough. So it, it's a lot about unconditional love. Um, we talk in psychology these days a lot about um, uh, secure attachment, knowing that our attachments to other people are not easily lost. Um, and that comes from communicating to them that no matter what they do, no matter what they achieve, they're still very much loved. So I think that's what we can do. You know, I'm, uh, I've got two daughters that are just, one's finished college I was going through. So I, I'm familiar with all these statistics about applications for these bigger colleges. Mm -hmm. They're going way up for the, the most famous colleges and they're going down for lesser colleges. So this might go along with what you're starting to hint at with the, the pressure in our culture, the pressure to succeed and to get into these big colleges, just as an example, is huge mm -hmm. these days. I mean, when I was a yeah. kid, it wasn't on our, our radar at all, you know? Uh, yeah. Now it's such a big deal. And so I think there is some pressure behind it um, that does affect parents. Like they feel they have to get their child into the best grammar school here in New York, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Or the best colleges. Um, and it's, it's very unfortunate because it puts a ton of pressure on kids. And getting back to the compulsive part itself, I think it can exaggerate symptoms for them. I also want to say, though, that merely being positive and affirming with a child isn't going to work either. We're always working yeah. to achieve a balance between affirming them and teaching them about reality. If all you do is say how wonderful they are, they're not going to believe it. And instead, they're going to have the imposter syndrome, you know. Um, so I think we need to let them know what, th what the reality is about what they need to do in the world to, to succeed, but also to let them know their love no matter what. Yeah, I think um, that even I myself, uh, I see the pressure uh, that the young people are on and or that young people are dealing with in regards to higher education. You know, 20 years ago when I was in Okay, I should be honest, 25 years ago when I was in high school, um, you know, uh, picking a trade was a, a completely fine and, and acceptable um, and encouraged thing to do, you know, becoming a carpenter or a plumber. But now every child has kind of got this pressure to be um, the absolute best version of a human that they can be. Yeah. Um, and and it, it, looks, it looks like, you know, they're having, a, a, it just doesn't look fun. It looks like a lot of um, pressure, a lot of hard work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can see the, the cracks in it. Um, I am curious, though, um, have it, uh, genetics playing such a, a, a big part in it. And uh, we just talked about parenting. What do you think uh, about culture's role 
in um, setting up this type of a, a personality trait. Yeah. I'm going to be very curious to see what you have to say about it in a moment, but I'll <laughs> say uh, I can't say a whole lot because while a fair amount of my practice is people who have obsessive compulsive personalities, I, I don't have a large enough sample to make generalizations about people who are raised in Asia or Europe or Africa. Um, however, I, I, I think it'd be really interesting if we had studies about the differences between people who are raised in capitalist leaning countries as mm -hmm. opposed to people that are raised in socialist leaning countries or cultures that promote independence as opposed to community. Um, but even that's complicated because on the one hand, capitalism might push someone so hard with their obsessive compulsive tendency saying, you can accomplish anything you want if you just work hard enough, which isn't true. Um, mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it can make it worse. On the other hand, there are outlets for that drive in capitalist countries that might not exist in, in other cultures. Uh, and similarly, in another culture you know, that doesn't have those outlets, their, their driven tendencies might go haywire because they don't right. have an outlet for it. But what, I'm curious. Yeah. I know you've lived all over. Sure. What's your? Yeah. No. I was. I was just thinking the last thing you said that that's a that's a very interesting um, uh, way to look at things. Um, yeah. I I do travel a lot. Um, I I don't talk about it too much on this channel, but I do get around. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I I brought up the question uh, because anecdotally, I feel like I do see some some the differences. They really jump out at me. So spending a lot of time in Latin America. Um, they have this very, I shouldn't say they, the countries that I've been in, um, Costa Rica, um, in, uh, spent some time in Mexico, uh, Colombia, um, a few other places. Oh, Panama, quite a, quite a lot of time in Panama. And they have a very relaxed culture. Um, when you ask, uh, you know, the repairman when he's going to get something done, he'll say mañana, you know, tomorrow. And that mm -hmm. means, you know, three weeks from now. Uh, and mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends in these countries and I really don't see any, um, strong indicators of, uh, a lot of people having, uh, obsessive or compulsive or, or you know, both together personalities. And then on the flip side, when I spend time in Asia, I see quite the opposite. Um, the culture is very oh. different. And I see a lot of those types of traits. Some are um, mm -hmm. being uh, directed in a, in a positive way. And, and a lot of times they're not. And, uh, yeah. you know, speaking of the stress that uh, the young people are under in the United States, you know, for me, it's like multiply that times five or 10 in some of the Asian countries that I've spent time uh, in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have seen that with some of my Asian parents, uh, my Asian patients whose parents mm -hmm. uh, were so demanding of them. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I was just curious if, if you had any opinion on on cultures that you've you've witnessed uh, that you think are handling or directing these traits in a, in a better or worse way. I don't know if you can speak to that or not. No, I, I'd be uh, really speculating a lot. Uh, but yeah. I know there can even be differences within this country, you know, uh, between sure. East Coast and West Coast. Uh, certainly New York is a hotbed for drive. Uh, and then, mm -hmm. I don't know how true this is, but you go to Seattle and you ask someone, so what do you do? Oh, oh, I, I hike and, and I kayak. It, it's not I'm an investment banker. You know, they talk about their um, uh, their uh, their avocations rather than vocations. I, I have a feeling that's starting to shift, too, but I'm not sure. Right. Yeah, I mean, I realized that in order to to make any or to come to any certain conclusions, there have to be you know a lot of different studies done, mm -hmm. um, and and so it's not something we can answer definitively. But even speaking to the U.S. as well, I spent time in Savannah, Georgia, uh, last year, mm -hmm. and they they seem very relaxed down there. Yeah. They seem to really be enjoying life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't see a lot of um, that type of behavior down there mm -hmm. uh, either. Um, Moving along, um, as you are a Jungian an, uh, analyst, uh, I know that his techniques help you to map the inner territory of what drives us. Can you speak mm -hmm. uh, more to how you see Carl Jung having influenced you as a psychotherapist? 
Sure. And just for any listeners who aren't familiar with him, Carl Jung was um, a groundbreaking psychiatrist uh, working at the beginning of the 20th century. He was originally a colleague of Freud and they broke up. But anyway, uh, I started reading Jung when I was in my mid-teens. And so he's had a huge uh, effect on me. I think one of the things that has inspired me most about him is his attitude toward the unconscious. That is the part of the psyche that's operating in the background all the time. Um, Jung's attitude towards it is a much more positive one. He sees it as a source of wisdom and creativity. Um, some other therapists might see it as more of a, a place where there are repressed memories. Uh, and Jung tried to teach us to look to the unconscious for guidance about where to move forward. This is another thing that was inspiring to me about Jung, that he emphasized what he called individuation, which is becoming whole, growing psychologically to the most complete person we can to develop all the different traits and different parts of ourselves. Um, and this is another thing that I think you brought to psychology that, that there are many different parts of ourselves. Yes, there's the id, the superego, um, but there are also there are archetypes such as uh, the hero, the saint, the judge, uh, that these are archetypal mm -hmm. potentials in us that ideally uh, we actualize to the, to the degree that we can. So looking at this in terms of how, how we look at mental health, rather than always looking backwards to, oh, you've got this problem because your mother dropped you on your head when you were a kid, it's yeah. more, well, what needs to develop in you now that's being blocked? What is it from the unconscious that wants to be actualized, included, or integrated that's being blocked? Because that might be the thing that's making you compulsive. He right. said, in fact, that individuation is a compulsive instinct. There's something really deep in us that wants to really to grow. Um, if that's blocked, we can become uh, obsessive compulsive in the most negative way. I, I think it's interesting about Jung himself. When he was around 35, he was starting to go through a really hard time. He and Freud had their differences. They quit talking to each other. And he went into mm -hmm. a long period of introspection where he looked at his dreams. He had these deep dialogues with different parts of himself. And what he realized is that he said, I have been a slave to my ideals. He was driven. And he realized that he was driven in an unhealthy way. He said, I had to kill off the hero. Mm -hmm. By that, I think he meant that he had these ambitions, I think it had more to do with the external world than developing yes. his own psychology. And that's, I think, a yeah. great message for all of us. So even after he changed and he killed off the hero, he continued to, to explore himself uh, in this very committed, driven way and to share with the world. So he took those compulsive energies and he put them in a more conscious, helpful place. 